Well, hello there. How are you? Are you ready for a bit more of our read-along of A Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula K. Le Guin? Are you ready for that? I'm using the Galanx edition. I know what you're using, but my page numbers might not work along with yours. There seems to be a lot of words on each page in this edition. <laughs> so, um... I'm starting tonight on page, the very, very top, sorry, of page 47 in my edition. All right, we're just into chapter three. Okay, so get your copy and are you ready to find out what Ged is up to tonight? Last night, if you remember, we left him. He'd just made friends. I don't know if we got a name. Oh, yes, we did Jasper. He just made, I say friends, acquaintances had just become acquainted with Jasper and Jasper was a little bit sneery although Ged is always thinking that people are looking down at him and mocking him isn't he maybe they are I don't know I'm not looking at things through Ged's eyes but I'm also noticing that he thinks a lot of people are mocking him but this time I kind of think he's right because Jasper is a little bit hoity-toity <laughs> here we go where you will, I do not know the house. Jasper took him down the corridors of the great house, showing him the open courts and the roofed halls, the room of shelves where the books of law and room tomes were kept, the great hearth where all the school gathered on festival days, and upstairs in the towers and under the roofs, the small cells where the students and the masters slept. Geds was in the south tower, with a window looking down over the steep roofs of Thwill Town to the sea. Like the other sleeping cells, it had no furnishing but a straw-filled mattress in the corner. We live very plain here, but I expect you won't mind that. I'm used to it. Presently, trying to show himself an equal of this polite, disdainful youth, he added, I suppose that you weren't when you first come along. Jasper looked at him and his look said without words, what could you possibly know about what I, son of the lord of the domain of Eolg on the Isle of Havnor, am or am not used to? What Jasper said aloud was simply, come this way. A gong had been rung whilst they were upstairs and they came down to eat the noon meal at the long table of the refectory, along with a hundred or more boys and young men. Each waited on himself, joking with the cooks through the window hatches of the kitchen that opened into the refectory, loading his plate from great bowls of food that steamed on the sills, sitting where he pleased at the long table. They say, Jasper told Ged, that no matter how many sit at this table, there is always room. Certainly there was room for both, both for many noisy groups of boys talking and eating mightily, and for older fellows, their grey cloaks clasped with silver at the neck, who sat more quietly by pairs or alone, with grave, pondering faces, as if they had much to think about. Jasper took Ged to sit with a heavy-set fellow called Vetch, who said nothing much but shoveled in his food with a will. He had the accent of the East Reach, and was very dark of skin, not red-brown like Ged and Jasper and most folk of the archipelago, but black-brown. He was plain, and his manners were not polished. He grumbled about the dinner when he'd finished it, but then turning to Ged said, At least it's not illusion. Like so much round here, it sticks to your ribs. Ged did not know what he meant, but he felt a certain liking for him, and was glad when after the meal, he stayed with them. They went down into the town that Ged might learn his way about it. Few and short as were the streets of thrill, they turned and twisted curiously among the high-roofed houses, and the way was easy to lose. It was a strange town, and strange also its people, fishermen and workmen and artisans like any others, but so used to the sorcery that is ever at play on the Isle of Wise, that they seemed half-sorcerers themselves. They talked, as Ged had learned, in riddles, and not one of them would blink to see a boy turn into a fish or a house fly up into the air, but knowing it for a schoolboy prank would go on cobbling's would they would go on cobbling shoes or cutting up mutton unconcerned. Coming up past the back door and round through the gardens of the great house, the three boys crossed the clear running Thwilburn onto a wooden bridge and went on northward among woods and pastures. The bar the path 
climbed and wound. They passed oak groves where shadows lay thick for all the brightness of the sun. There was one grove not far away to the left that Ged could never quite see plainly. The path never reached through, although it always seemed to be about to. He could not even make out what kind of trees they were. Vetch, seeing him gazing, said softly, That? That's the eminent grove. We can't come there yet. In the hot sunlit pastures, yellow flowers bloomed. Sparkweed, said Jasper. They grow where the wind dropped the ashes of burning Ilion, when Ereth Akbe defended the Inward Isles from the Fire Lord. He blew on a withered flower head and the seeds, shaken loose, went up on the wind like sparks of fire in the sun. The path led them up and around the base of a great green hill, round and treeless, the hill that Ged had seen from the ship as they entered the charmed waters of Rake Island. On the hillside, Jasper halted. At home in Havner, I have heard much about Gauntish wizardry, and always in praise, so that I've wanted for a long time to see the manner of it. Here now we have a Gauntishman, and we stand on the slopes of Roke Knoll, whose roots go down to the centre of the earth. All spells are strong here. Play us a trick, Sparrowhawk. Show us your style. Ged, confused and taken aback, said nothing. Later on, Jasper, Fetch said in his plain way, let him be a while. He has either skill or power, or the doorkeeper wouldn't have let him in. Why shouldn't he show it now as well as later? Right, Sparrowhawk? I have both skill and power, Ged said. Show me what kind of thing that you're talking about. Illusions, of course. Tricks. Games of seeming. Like this. Pointing his finger, Jasper spoke a few strange words, and where he pointed on the hillside among the green grasses, a little thread of water trickled and grew, and now a spring gushed out and the water went running down the hill. Ged put his hand in the stream and it felt wet, Dank, drank of it and it was cool, yet for all that it would quench no thirst being an illusion. Jasper, with another word, stopped the water and the grasses waved dry in the sunlight. Now you vetch he said with his cool smile. Vetch scratched his head and looked glum, but he took up a bit of earth in his hand and began to sing tunelessly over it, moulding it with his dark fingers and shaping it, pressing it, stroking it, and suddenly it was a small creature like a bumblebee or furry fly that flew humming off over Roke Knoll and vanished. Ged stood staring, crestfallen. What did he know but mere village witchery, spells to call goats, cure warts, move loads or mend pots? I do no such tricks as these, he said. That was enough for Vetch, who was for going on, but Jasper said, Why don't you? Sorcery is not a game, you know. We Gauntishmen, we do not play it for pleasure or for praise, Ged answered haughtily. What do you play it for? For money? Jasper inquired. No! But he could not think of anything more to say that would hide his ignorance and save his pride. Jasper laughed, not ill-humouredly, and he went on, leading him around Roke Knoll. Ged followed, sullen and sore-hearted, knowing he'd behaved like a fool and blaming Jasper for it. That night, as he lay wrapped in his cloak on the mattress in his cold, unlit cell of stone in the utter silence of the great house of Roke, the strangeness of the place and the thought of all the spells and sorceries that had been worked there began to come over him heavily. Darkness surrounded him. Dread filled him. He wished he were anywhere else but Roke. But Vetch came to the door, a little bluish ball of werelight nodding over his head to light the way, and asked if he could come in and talk for a while. He asked Ged about Gaunt, and then spoke fondly of his own home, Isles of the Each of the East Reach, telling how the smoke of village hearth fires is blown across that quiet sea at evening between the small islands with funny names, Corp, Cop and Holp, Venway and Vemish, Ifish, Coppish and Snig. When he sketched the shapes of those lands on the stones of the floor with his finger to show Ged how they lay, the lines he drew shone dim as if drawn with a stick of silver for a while before they faded. Vetch had been there three years at the school and soon would be made sorcerer. He thought no more of performing the lesser arts of magic than a bird thinks of flying, yet a greater unlearned skill he possessed, which was the art of kindness. 
That night, and always from then on actually, he offered and gave Ged friendship, a sure and open friendship which Ged could not help but return. Ah, oh, good old Vetch. He seems nice. He seems nice! I wish I hadn't chosen that voice from now. A little bit too brash. There we go. We'll stick with it, as long as I remember it. <laughs> there you go. So, that'll do us for tonight. So, um, yeah. A couple of you are saying on there I could read um, that you're enjoying the book. Like I said to you, and everyone is entitled to their own opinions, of course, so you may have a differing one to me. And that's what, that's what it's all about, isn't it? It's all about the discussion. They're talking about it afterwards. But, um... Yeah, I mean, I'm enjoying it. Now the story is kicking off a little bit. Like I said, it as a as the person reading it out loud, I have to try and work out the pace of things. I have to try and work out the intonation that um, Le Guin is trying to give. When you're reading it in your head, it is really different to reading it out loud, isn't it? So forgive me if I said that I found the pace a little bit different. I did find it a little bit different. Just tell me the truth. Um, so yeah, um, let's think, is there anything exciting I can tell you? I haven't really done proper Wiffle Waffle for ages, have I? Uh, Saturday for me today, hence I'm in my glad rags. Uh, I've just taken Phoebe out for the second night in a row out on the, out on the town. Cool. Life's of a teenager, hey? So yeah, so she's out and about in the town tonight. Blake, he's about to go out with his friends. I said, do you want me to wait up? And he went, uh... I won't be home till about 4am. Uh, okay. <laughs> see, you, see you tomorrow then, afternoon. Um, so yes, yeah, so I've got a bit of a bit of a boring old night, really. But never mind. I don't mind. The other two, they're playing their video games. So, yeah, give me a chance to, to read and think about life. <laughs> uh, it... Weather's still a bit mank here, like I said to you the other day, didn't I, about how, so it's now what, um, 13th of July, and the weather is blooming awful, blah, 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 it is not, it is not the normal summer July weather that we get, yeah, of course, I've still got hay fever, have you heard me snuffling and sneezing tonight, I just stop about twice to go and blow my nose halfway through, um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't really got anything else exciting to tell you, uh, um, 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 no, nothing. I had a sleep today. <laughs> it's because I had to stay up late last night to go and collect Phoebe, you see, from town. And now I've got to do it again tonight. She won't be home at 4am. Gosh, she's only 16, so there is none of that. <laughs> Alright, okay. Um, Sunday for me tomorrow, so I will be here. I will be here. Snuffly as ever, but I'll be here. Alright, okay. See you soon.